welcome to Hub History, the show where we share our favorite stories from Boston history. This is episode 43, The Case of the Somnambulist. Hi, I'm Jake. And I'm Nikki. This week, we're going to talk about a scandal that rocked Victorian Boston in the 1840s. A tale of seduction, murder, and the unlikeliest of defenses. But before we talk about this dark spot in Beacon Hill's past, it's time to take a look at what's coming up this week in Boston history. Monday is August 28th, and on August 28th, 1774, John Adams wrote to Abigail from Philadelphia, where he was attending the First Continental Congress. The letter is revealing, showing how there were two sides to John Adams, the father. He was both doting and demanding. Remember my tender love to my little nabby. Tell her she must write me a letter and enclose it in the next you send. I am charmed with your amusement with our little Johnny. Tell him I am glad to hear he is so good a boy as to read to his mama for her entertainment and to keep himself out of the company of rude children. Tell him I hope to hear a good account of his accidents in nomenclature when I return. Kiss my little Charlie and Tommy for me. Tell them I shall be home by November, but how much sooner I know not. The education of our children is never out of my mind. Train them to virtue. Habituate them to industry, activity, and spirit. Make them consider every vice as shameful and unmanly. Fire them with ambition to be useful. Make them disdain to be destitute of any useful or ornamental knowledge or accomplishment. Fix their ambition upon great and solid objects, and their contempt upon little, frivolous, and useless ones. It is time, my dear, for you to begin to teach them French. Every decency, grace, and honesty should be inculcated upon them. On August 29th, 1905, a group of about 200 Italian-Americans was coming home from a baseball game in Sharon. After arriving at South Station, they assembled into an impromptu parade and began to march down Federal Street toward the north end. A trolley quickly came up behind them and began clanging its bell to get the marchers to step aside. A few moments later, another trolley came down the street from the front and did the same thing. The next day's globe relays what happened next. There was considerable confusion, with the motorman in the rear and the one in the front clanging their bells. Motorman Lyons failed to bring the car to a full stop, and it is said that, in a moment of excitement, Ferrati, with the American flag aloft, left the side of his comrade, who was bearing the Italian colors, and dashing over to the front of the car, held the colors up in the face of the motorman with a demand that he should stop. This action proved a signal for a general demonstration upon the part of the paraders. A number feared that the comrade was in trouble, and they dashed up to the front of the car. The motorman reached down and lifted the heavy iron switch stick, which he wielded aloft, but it was no use and he was thrown bodily from the car and landed on the pavement a number of feet distant. The car was still moving through the parade with nobody in charge of the motor and was in imminent danger of causing trouble. At this point, the conductor jumped and ran up to the assistance of his motorman, and he was pounced upon. In the melee, the glass was broken and the men and women passengers fled in a panic, many of them leaving parcels in the car which were appropriated immediately afterwards by others than their rightful owners. When Carter jumped from his car, he was set upon. His nose was broken and he was beaten almost into insensibility, and would probably have fared worse but for the timely arrival of the police, who put an end to the disturbance and scattered the crowd. Wednesday is August 30th. After a highly publicized, sensational trial that lasted almost a month, Professor John White Webster of Harvard Medical School was convicted of murdering Dr. George Parkman in 1849. The case was gruesome, with Webster accused of beating his acquaintance to death with a fireplace poker over a bad debt, then dismembering the body and trying to burn it and dissolve it in acid. The trial had seen the first use of forensics in a murder case, established the legal standard of beyond a reasonable doubt, and became so sensationalized that Boston police officers sold tickets to the trial. After Webster's conviction, the defense filed a writ of error, claiming that the jury had received misleading instructions. When that failed, they appealed to the governor for a pardon. Governor Briggs had allowed a black sailor to go to the gallows in a similar case. Webster was a member of Boston's Brahmin upper class who were supporting his bid for clemency. A local newspaper warned what would happen if Briggs pardoned Webster. If he relents in this case, though the entire population of the state petitioned for a remission of sentence, 
Governor Briggs will forfeit all claim to public respect as a high-minded, honorable, and impartial chief magistrate. He can do one of two things and retain his character as a man and a public servant, resign his office, or let the law take its course. On August 30th, 1850, the law took its course. Professor Webster, who had occasionally enjoyed watching a public execution when he was a lad, was taken from his cell to the gallows and publicly hanged. He's buried in the North End's Copse Hill Burying Ground. In his poem on Paul Revere's ride, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote, Hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch of the North Church Tower as a signal light. One if by land and two if by sea, an eye on the opposite shore will be. He neglected to mention that, in case of hurricane, it would be best to take cover. On August 31, 1954, Hurricane Carol slammed into Boston with wind gusts up to 125 miles per hour. It damaged or destroyed over 10,000 homes across New England and left almost a third of the region without power. 65 people were killed in New England, and the storm caused almost a half a billion dollars worth of damage, back when that was real money. One thing that was damaged was Old North Church. Carol toppled the wooden steeple atop the brick church, leaving it smashed to kindling in the street below. Interestingly, this was not the original 1726 steeple. A storm known as the Snow Hurricane had destroyed the original in 1804. School children around the country donated coins to a replacement fund, and the new steeple was built in 1955. It's topped by the church's original weather vane. Friday is September 1st, and as the nation's first subway opened under Tremont Street on September 1st, 1897, newspaper headlines proclaimed, First car off the earth. Underground transit is no longer a dream in the hub. It had been a project many years in the making. By the late 19th century, Boston's downtown streets were hopelessly congested, with horse-drawn and electric streetcars and private carriages choking main thoroughfares to a halt. The city debated between an elevated monorail and a subway, before finally choosing to build the subway. In 1895, construction began on the first tunnel along Tremont Street from Boylston to Park Street. After over two years of construction, and after the tragic gas explosion we describe in episode 21, the tunnel was finally ready for business. Just before 6 a.m. on September 1st, motorman Jimmy Reed loaded passengers onto his car in front of a cheering crowd. With a cry of, all aboard for the subway in Park Street, he rang the bell and drove into history, taking the first passengers through the nation's first subway just over 20 minutes later. On September 2nd, 1904, Boston police issued one of their first citations for speeding in a motor car. The next day, the offender, C.H. Cole of Middletown, Connecticut, was hauled into court to answer charges that he had tried to melt the asphalt on Commonwealth Avenue. The 1936 Boston Almanac recounts the case. Patrolman Hyde of Station 16 said Cole was doing not less than 19 miles an hour, and that it made his hair stand on end just to see it. Cole's excuse was that his brakes were out of order, and he had not dared to use them coming down the hill. He then added a deft touch by admitting shyly that his outrageous speed was due in part to Boston's magnificent roads. He paid a fine of $5. Finally, Sunday is September 3rd. John Cotton was the minister of the Anglican St. Botolph's Church in Boston, Lincolnshire, for over two decades. For much of this time, he advocated for reforms within the church that would purify it, as well as a simpler liturgy. In 1632, the Anglican hierarchy began to crack down on the growing strain of Puritanism within the church, and Cotton was forced into hiding. In October of that year, he would write to his wife Sarah, Where I am for the present, I am very fitly and welcomely accommodated. I thank God, so as I see here I might rest, desired enough, till my friends at home shall direct further. They desire also to see thee here, but I think it not safe yet, till we see how God will deal with our neighbors at home. For if you should now travel this way, I fear you will be watched and dogged at the heels. The family considered fleeing to Holland, where many Puritans had taken refuge, but instead decided to immigrate to Massachusetts. Before dawn on a June day in 1633, John and Sarah Cotton rode in secret out to the ship Griffin that was headed for Massachusetts. Their first child was born during the Long Crossing, and they appropriately named him Seaborn. 
On September 3, 1633, the Griffin landed in Boston. John Cotton was invited to be the pastor of Boston's Puritan First Church, where he watched over many congregants from St. Botoff's in Lincolnshire. He was considered among the finest Puritan minds of the era, and he would eventually found a Puritan dynasty as the grandfather and namesake of Cotton Mather. Now let's turn to our main topic and set the scene for a brothel murder in 1840s Beacon Hill. We'll start with the transformation from countryside to Victorian grandeur. Beacon Hill takes its name from a bucket of tar that once perched on a pole on the top of the hill, which could be lit on fire to warn the town of an emergency. You can find a monument to this beacon on the grounds of the State House along Bodwin Street. The area known as Beacon Hill today originally featured three hills, Beacon, Pemberton, and Mount Vernon. All three were substantially reduced to be used as landfill along what is now Charles Street, but that's a topic for another day. But to understand the social history of Beacon Hill, you have to start way before that. Boston was founded on ocean-going trade, centered in the Long Wharf area where the aquarium sits now. State Street, or King Street as it was known before the Revolution, was our main avenue of commerce. And Boston was primarily a walking city, which meant that you had to live near where you worked. And thus, wealthy merchants and ship owners lived down by their stores and warehouses. Beacon Hill at that time was very much a rural countryside. Because the area was remote and mostly public land, the east slope of Beacon Hill was a prime location for public institutions such as the almshouse, the workhouse, the jail, the granary, and the animal pound. So, you can see why that area wasn't exactly prime home-building real estate. Beginning in the 1730s, a few wealthier folks started building homes on the south slope of the hill, the area that overlooks the common. Thomas Hancock, uncle to John Hancock, was advised by his doctor that the fresh country air would do him well. John Singleton Copley, a not-so-starving artist, thought that the quiet and the open lighting would benefit his painting. And thus others followed them. By the early 19th century, the public institutions were relocated, and the upper class began to fill in along Beacon Street and a few blocks back. In contrast, the North Slope housed the help for families on the South Slope, immigrants, and African Americans, as well as the majority of Boston's adventuresses, as they were known at the time, and their houses of ill repute. And of course, with brothels comes liquor and gambling. The slope held a dear place in the hearts of many sailors, and respectable people such as yourselves would never set foot in the neighborhood. Today, many consider Mount Vernon Street, which runs down the backside of the hill, to be the most prestigious street address in America. And by the 1840s, this area had filled in quite nicely. Lewisburg Square, halfway down Mount Vernon, had been completed and this was the fashionable place to be. However, a few remnants from the neighborhood's darker side were holding on. At that time, there was an alley on the upper stretch of Mount Vernon that cut across to Pinckney Street. In that alley, you would find a brothel that catered to the well-to-do gentlemen of the neighborhood. One of Boston's most well-known ladies of the night, Maria Bickford, made her home in that establishment. It was said that she had a body like a pigeon, which was a compliment in case that wasn't clear. Big in the front and big in the back. Maria had humble roots a country girl who married James Bickford at 16 and settled in Bangor, Maine. After the death of her infant daughter, Maria had a hard time shaking the melancholy. Some friends tried to cheer her up with a trip to Boston. And on that fateful adventure to the big city, Maria was hooked. As James Bickford told it, while in the city, she appeared delighted with everything she saw and on her return home, expressed a desire to reside permanently in Boston. She became dissatisfied with her humble condition. At age 19, Maria ran away to Boston. Things must have been a bit rocky in the beginning, as she eventually wrote James a note. I cannot let you know where I am, for the people where I board do not know that I've got a husband. James, I feel very unsteady, and will consent to live with you and keep house, but you must consent for me to have my liberty. He came to Boston to make amends, but when he discovered that she was working in a brothel, he left her there. And against the odds, Maria landed on her feet, and the life of the sporting girl agreed with her. 
Her beauty allowed her to attract the best clientele, and her business sense enabled her to accumulate enough wealth to hire a maid, purchase the most fashionable clothes, and maintain complete independence. In 1845, one of her clients, Albert Terrell, declared his love for her. He was a young married man and father to two children. His father was a prominent Weymouth shoe manufacturer who had served for 12 years in the Massachusetts State Legislature. In 1844, Albert inherited $8,000, which was a sizable fortune at that time. And within a year and a half, he had squandered it all on Maria. Now, their relationship rocked Boston. Though they were both married, they lived and traveled together while presenting as husband and wife. And it was known to be a very tumultuous union, perhaps because Maria refused to stop working. After all, she had become quite accustomed to living the life of a wealthy, independent woman. And so she continued to entertain clients at various brothels, even as she and Albert lived together in a boarding house. On September 29, 1845, due to their lack of discretion, Albert was indicted on charges of adultery. He managed to evade the police for several weeks, but was eventually captured and arraigned. His friends and relatives, including his young wife, convinced the prosecutor to postpone the proceedings for six months so that he could be reformed. After posting bond, he returned to Maria at the brothel off Mount Vernon, but their reunion would be short-lived. On October 26, 1845, the owners of the house, Joel Lawrence and his wife, saw Maria and Albert arguing throughout the day. At 4.30 a.m. the next day, they heard a shriek, a heavy thud, and then someone rushing down the stairs and out the door several moments later. Someone then reported smelling smoke coming from one of Maria's rooms, and the Lawrences went to investigate. They discovered Maria's body. Brutally murdered, she was found on her back in her nightgown. Her throat had been slit from ear to ear with such force that her head was nearly severed from her body. Some clothing had been piled up on top of her body and set on fire. A bloody razor was found at the foot of the bed. A man's vest and cane were found, stained with blood. There was little doubt about who committed the murder. Maria had entertained a client the evening before, but Albert was seen entering the building sometime after midnight. About 5.30 that morning, a witness spotted him bargaining with a livery stable keeper, saying he had got into a little difficulty and wanted to go to his wife's father in Weymouth. After collecting money and his belongings from his family, the following day he fled to Montreal. Albert then planned to journey onward to Liverpool. However, the ship encountered inclement weather and turned back, causing him to board a ship to New Orleans instead. Police in Louisiana had received a tip about the fugitive, and on December 5th, they boarded the boat and arrested him. Despite all the grief Albert caused them, his family hired Rufus Choate, a famous Boston attorney who was noted for the innovative defense strategies he employed to acquit his clients. And as luck would have it, although initially public opinion in Boston sided with Maria, by the time of the trial the public had turned and viewed her as an immoral seductress who took advantage of Albert. Choate allowed one of his junior counsel, Anis Merrill, to deliver the opening argument for the defense. He maligned Maria's character, presenting the possibility that she had cut her own throat, as suicide was almost the natural death of persons of her character. He painted a vision of Maria as the seductress and Albert as the victim, stating that she had succeeded in a wonderful manner in ensnaring the prisoner. His love for her was passing the love ordinarily borne by men for women. She, for a long time, had him spellbound by her depraved and lascivious arts. This argument played to the fears of the moralistic culture of Bostonians at that time, who saw prostitution becoming more and more bold. Many witnesses for the prosecution could testify to Albert's affair with Maria and the presence of Albert at the brothel that evening, but there were no eyewitnesses to the actual crime. Choate emphasized to the jury that no matter how overwhelming the evidence of Albert's presence at the brothel that evening, the evidence was all circumstantial, as no one had seen Albert kill her. Choate set forth three possible explanations for the jury to consider. The first was that Maria could have committed suicide. However, the brutality of the slashing combined with the fire made this explanation implausible. Second, they proposed that somebody else had killed her. She had a long roster of clients who may have killed her due to jealousy or other motives. 
And as a third possibility, Choate turned to an alternative explanation, that Albert, as a habitual sleepwalker, could have murdered Maria under the influence of a nightmare. In the 1840s, there were no medical explanations for sleepwalking, and medical experts differed over its cause. It really was a great unknown. Choate read treatises to the jury with descriptions of violence attributed to sleepwalking, while reminding them that if they returned a guilty verdict, Terrell would certainly be executed, even if there existed a remote chance that he was innocent. He also introduced witnesses who testified that Albert suffered from somnambulism and told tales of Terrell walking in his sleep. Choate emphasized that if Albert killed Maria while sleepwalking, he was not culpable for the crime. For his closing argument, Choate assured the jury that he would not take up much of their time. And then he spoke for six and a half hours. We don't have a record of his full speech, but the Boston Daily Bee included this excerpt. How far does the testimony lead you? Did any human being see the prisoner strike the blow? No. Did any human being see him in the house after 9 o'clock the previous evening? No. Did any human being see him run from the house? No. Did any human being see him with a drop of blood on his hands? No. Can anyone say she did not take her own life? No. Can anyone say that on that night he was not laboring under the disease to which he was subject from his youth? No. Has he ever made a confession of the deed? To friend or thief taker, not one word. He concluded with, Every juror, when he puts into the urn the verdict of guilty, writes upon it also, Let him die. Under the iron law of old Rome, it was the custom to bestow a civic wreath upon him who should save the life of a citizen. Do your duty this day, gentlemen, and you too may deserve the civic crown. On March 28th, the judge gave instructions to the jury that made mention of Maria's depraved character and referred to somnambulism as a form of insanity. After less than two hours of deliberation, the jury returned its verdict of not guilty. This marks the first known case in the world, and one of the few times ever, in which sleepwalking has been used as a successful defense to murder. At a second trial, he would also be found not guilty of arson on the same defense. He did, however, plead no contest to that postponed adultery charge. Apparently, he must have woken up for that part. For adultery, he was sentenced to three years of hard labor in the state prison. To learn more about today's cast of characters and the sleepwalking defense, check out this week's show notes at hubhistory.com 043. We'll have a photo of Maria, a rendering of the murder, and the front page of a pamphlet printed and sold to entertain Bostonians with the story, entitled The Life and Death of Mrs. Maria Bickford, a beautiful female who was inhumanely murdered in the moral and religious city of Boston. And we'll share a link to read the pamphlet online through the Cornell Law Library's collections. And lest you think this defense is a relic of the past, we'll link to a modern-day case from Mohegan Sun in 2012 in which the defense was less successful. And of course, we'll have links and sources for all of this week's historical anniversaries. After listening to our show about the Coconut Grove fire, Reverend Peter Preble wrote in with some good-natured criticism about our pronunciation. Hey, Hub History. Love the podcast, but it is not Quinn C. It is Quinn Z. Thanks. When I asked which of us he had busted, he replied, I do not like to name names, of course, but it was in the wonderful episode about the Coconut Grove fire. I really hope I pronounced Reverend Preble's name right. It is stink to mispronounce a name in a comment about mispronouncing a name. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at podcast at hubhistory.com. We're Hub History on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Or you can go to hubhistory.com and click on the Contact Us link. And while you're on the site, hit the subscribe link and be sure that you never miss an episode. And if you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, please think about writing us a brief review. It's the best way to help others discover the show. That's all for now. We'll be back next week with a show about Boston's ancient custom of perambulating the bounds.